Good morning. Welcome back to theCUBE's day three coverage of Snowflake Summit live from Caesars Forum in Las Vegas. Lisa Martin here with Dave Vellante. As I mentioned, this is our third day of covering Snowflake, the whole ecosystem of Snowflake, customers, partners, executives, leaders. We're going to be talking with Snowflake and Snowplow next. They're providing together a competitive solution for modeling and analyzing conversion journeys in near real time. Dave, that's something that we as consumers expect to have a, a seamless conversion journey, but it's hard for organizations to achieve that. Yeah, a lot of snow going on here. Snow plow, snowflake, a lot of snow, <laughs> snow. themes. <laughs> uh, bring it I on. Ironically, it's like 100 degrees outside, but we're, we're talking all snow. We have two guests here with us. Mike Robbins, the head of engineering at Snowplow is here, and Patrick Crosby, senior mm. manager of Technology Alliance is at Snowflake. Great to have you guys. Thanks for having us. Great to be here, thank the, you. The one funny thing is that this whole thing is on brand. This whole expo hall is on brand, very, very much the whole snow theme and it's ironically freezing in here, so <laughs> we don't know it's 100 degrees outside. Pa uh, Mike, talk to us a little bit about Snowplow. What, I see 1.9 million sites and apps use Snowplow to generate and model first party customer data from across their digital interfaces, capture descriptive customer journeys. Talk to us about Snowplow, what you guys do. Yeah, so a lot of it's really around behavioral data collection, as you mentioned. So looking at users and, and customers on websites and apps and server side and IoT and all that sort of good stuff, and really trying to get a better understanding of what consumer behavior is effectively happening, and increasingly now, a lot of importance and focus on the doing that in a first party way. So a couple of years ago, it didn't, didn't really matter as much. You could get away with a lot of third party stuff, but particularly now in this emergent market and, and sort of post all these privacy breaches, there's this increasing consideration of how to do that in your own environment and capture that in a first party way, rather than rely on some external vendor. So we've seen a really big uptake of lots of people considering that more and more, um, and as a result, we've we've seen a lot of kind of uptake on a lot of those I'm sure those you get sites. this question all the time, is like, why, don't I, why don't I just use Google Analytics? And you kind of addressed it, but maybe you could address it more directly. I think, it, I think it's part of it, which is there's some people that just can't use Google Analytics now, right? There's a lot of legal rulings, particularly in the EU, where they just go like, well, no, you, you can't go and do that, because it's being processed in a way that fundamentally, um, from an a European perspective infringes on human rights, basically. So some people just can't use it, and the people that can are going, well, look, it's a good option, but there's a change now, there's a big change between Google Analytics 3 and Google Analytics 4, and it's giving people the chance to reevaluate and go, well, actually, is this what we want to take into the future for the next 10 years, 15 years? And that's a lot of how long GA has been around. So people are kind of at the decision point now of going like, is this going to be right for us in the future? And a lot of people are going, no, maybe not, maybe not. Maybe we want to consider sort of other different options. So there's Compliance and there's functionality. Compliance right. and, and functionality I think is a, is a big one and just transparency as well, right? Um, is a, a lot of people are um, you know, advertising on Google or um, run ads through Google or buy ads through Google and they go, well actually I want to be able to measure the effectiveness of my campaigns. I want to be able to, to measure that without some player that kind of potentially may have a, a vested interest in you know, favoring towards themselves over say a Facebook or another advertising network. So a lot of transparency in going, well if the data is in my environment, if it's sitting in my, my Snowflake account, if it's sitting in the data cloud there, I have the ability to kind of audit that and for a lot of people that's a, that's a really important thing. It's, a, it's fundamentally about trust. Yeah, and that transparency one is really important and something that we at Snowflake have seen in a variety of different industries and use cases and particularly in, in this case, like the ability to be able to have first party data collection to actually as a brand to own all of that data about your customers in your own owned and operated infrastructure is very powerful and so um, we're working with a ton of amazing partners like Snowplow and so they're able to, to bring all of that in and, and pull it into that customer Snowflake instance and then they're able to, to combine that and unify that with a variety of other um, pieces of, of information and so the transparency the breaking down of data silos is, is really powerful. It's, it's critical for organizations that it's no longer nice to have. It's really critical to, to drive revenue, to prevent churn, you know, net customer retention rate, and these are things that businesses across every industry have to do these days to stay yeah, competitive, absolutely. to stay in business. Yeah, and it's customer expectations that you, know, you own that customer data, right? Like, why are you going and sending it somewhere else? Why are you going and storing it in these other systems? And you know, we've all probably been subject to you know, a lot of emails going, okay, you've had this account leak or this account leak. But really, I think organizations are starting to understand that sometimes using all those different things can be a liability, and really you want to have control over that environment yourself. So we're seeing lots of that. We're seeing lots of increases in sort of data sharing with a lot of this Snowflake stuff as well. So rather than sending the, you know, the data um, to some other kind of third party vendor, we're seeing more of these relationships directly between you know, brands and companies and brands and vendors and, and customers, which is opening up a lot more sort of collaboration and transparency behind yeah. how a lot of those, those partnerships work. 
Now, yeah. you're doing this inside a snow park? Uh, we, do a, we do a bit inside of Snow Park. So we do a lot of attribution inside of Snow Park. Um, we'd love to move it over to container services. So that's something that we're, we're looking at at the moment. Um, but a lot of the multi-touch attribution we, we do. So, you know, in terms of how people are converting on the platform, and, you know, it could be e-commerce, it could be a media site where you're, you know, you're logging in and paying through a paywall. You know, what are the channels that get you to that conversion? You know, what, what is the marketing team spending money on that is effective? Um, and that's a really challenging thing to measure. Um, particularly in the, a Google-style ecosystem where effectively you've got a black box and they'll tell you what's effective. Um, but really, you know, doing that in Snowflake and Snow Park means you get to see the innards of that, that working machine, right? It's not a black box that tells you, you know, this number and this number and doesn't explain it. Um, and I think a lot of stuff is around that explainability component at the moment, which is, well, why is that channel effective? Or why should we spend more on this or less on this? And particularly in the economic climate that we're at at the moment is that's a really critical factor to explain, you know, the impact of those economic decisions on, you know, product and users and, and acquisition yeah. as well. And those features like Snow Park and streaming are really what's unlocking a lot of the, the value here. So being able to, to combine the power of Snowflake with Snowplow and drive those analytics um, and actually get some of that, that real-time perspective and then giving you the flexibility to do the modeling and the visualization. Um, that's all sort of, that's what's really, I think, coming to fruition here with a lot of the new capabilities that um, we're releasing and that Snowplow has released. And so it's, it's really amazing to see this um, and actually give brands a really amazing opportunity as, you know, they're being forced to shift over to a, a new version of, of Google so they can really sort of step back and evaluate, are there other options where I could actually get a, a more powerful solution? Time to switch. But so, so the journey started with using Snowflake at the back end, right? And I saw, I'm, see, I'm seeing Snowplow, and then now you're in, increasingly investigating Snowpark container services and actually being native inside. Yeah, of and I think it's kind of, we're tracking the evolution of the, of the product, right? Yeah. It really started as this, this data warehouse and now is emerging as all these, these other sort of services as part of that data cloud. So particularly for a lot of our customers, is you know that that data warehouse is the core of everything, but then you go and add on the the compute layer, and then you can start to run your personalization or your recommendation engines and and that sort of thing. Um, and then increasingly, we've got you know as is the nature of things, people asking more about AI. So a lot of the LLM stuff and um, the the Nvidia keynote, and people sort of interested in all this new stuff they can do. So. It's been a really massive problem with data historically is your, your data is sitting in one place and your compute and all the interesting things have sat in another. And we're kind of increasingly finding this convergence of, well, your data shouldn't be over here and your compute over here. It really makes sense for them both to be in the same place. And I think a lot of the data cloud announcements are kind of continuing with the idea of, well, everything is in the same place and there's this concept of sort of data gravity, which is, you know, the more data you're adding into something, it pulls in everything else. And that's both from a data perspective, but also a, an organization perspective Absolutely. as well. And it um, unlocks a ton of flexibility as well. And I think it's another dynamic when you're using a, a single monolithic solution, right? Like you are, you're, you're waiting on innovation and sort of the pace and the choices and decisions that they have to make. But um, as an organization, as a brand who, if you're customer data, it is, it is a critical asset to many of these businesses. It is their differentiating asset, is the reason that they're able to compete and grow and be successful in, in these increasingly competitive markets. And so you want to own that asset and you want to have the flexibility to, to leverage that asset in a variety of ways. And so um, this gives them that ability. So they're able to unify that. They're able to leverage amazing um, solutions that are, that are there. Um, but they're also able to do things in-house, to do modeling in-house, to extend those capabilities in, in any way that they'd like. And so that's, that's another, I think, critical part of this. Mike, you must have a favorite customer story that you think really articulates the value prop of what Snowplow and Snowflake yeah. are doing together that helps maybe even like a, where you came in and replaced Google Analytics? Yeah, I mean, we, we've, done that, we've done that a lot of times. <laughs> um, I think, look, I think one of the big customers for us was uh, folks called Digital Virgo who run a mobile payments platform. Um, so effectively, you know, they've got something like two billion users worldwide. Um, and effectively, it's paying for something on your mobile. So you could be in a sports stadium buying a ticket or a drink, or you could be in a train station um, getting a, a promotion or a discount or something like that. But effectively, pay on your phone, which is a massive, massive thing. It's kind of prevalent everywhere. Um, and one of the big issues they were on Google, and one of the big issues they had was just this latency be between, you know, when they were getting the data and then when they could actually make a decision on it. And you think about 
but you know, you're, so they were big into sort of a um, lot of inventory and campaigns as part of FIFA, but also the NBA finals recently as well, is like the performance of that campaign is, is happening in real time, right? Like people are on their phones, it's not a, you know, you're buying a car and you go and buy it in three months time. They want to know like how that spend is influencing and how users are interacting with that and then basically personalize effectively in real time. So they really connect those telecommunications providers with the, the brands directly as a proxy, but they couldn't do that with something like Google Analytics. They just didn't have the quality of the data and the, the latency was too high. So a lot of stuff in Snowflake where we can get that data in there in, in seconds and increasingly things like Snowpipe streaming, they can then go and make those decisions, go back to brands and go, okay, we're going to optimize this in, in real time. Looking at this acquisition, you know, we're going to stop running this campaign, we're going to switch campaigns, um, you know, we're going to increase the, the impressions. So for them, that was a really powerful thing because it's effectively an audience of two billion people, right? Is even a tiny optimized change is, you know, has a massive, massive impact. Yeah, and I think what's really powerful about the partnership that we have here is that on the front end of that, right, like, you know, we want to make sure that, that customers are having all that critical data within, within Snowflake, but the, the collection of it is, is a really challenging problem to be able to actually know how to get the data from the point of, of, of activation, if it's your phone, if it's a site, um, and then being able to do the validation and, and all of the important, in some cases you actually need to retry those events. So there's a lot of actually nuance and complexity to achieving uh, the landing of that data um, accurately and completely in, um, in, in Snowflake, and, and Snowplow is a really amazing solution on that side, and that's what's able to give customers the granularity um, and the accuracy Accuracy that they need to have this sort of these sorts of campaigns. Explain Snowpipe streaming. What does that do for you? So basically, so historically you've had to kind of batch load data into Snowflake, which basically means you're not going to insert one event at a time or one user at a time. You're going to group them all together and you're going to do it as one big batch, which is the historically been the fastest way to do it. Um, and generally you can do that every couple of minutes, which is pretty good for a lot of folks is generally they're not, not reacting much faster than that. But Snowpipe streaming gives us this new capability of essentially having a fire hose where we can put in as much or as little as we want and it goes into Snowflake effectively immediately. So within a, within a couple of seconds. So particularly for real time use cases where you want to look at what's happening now compared to six months ago or three months ago, historically that could have been quite difficult to do because you would get it at minutely intervals but you wouldn't be able to sort of predict beyond that. Um, whereas this sort of second to sub-second latency really really unlocks a lot of those real-time use cases that previously we would have needed a lot of engineering effort to, to build, um, whereas now it all runs basically effectively within the same cloud. So you're essentially working on live data. You're working on very close it's to very live Very close data. to live data, yeah. and, and, and then it, when there's a change, do you use some kind of like change data capture or something similar to that? Or? Yeah, so a lot of people doing CDC with a lot of event stuff, it's, it's kind of effectively a change in state or an action for a lot of customers, um, and that just opens the door to very quick personalization, right? Which is, you know, if someone is abandoning a cart, sending them an email 30 minutes later or an hour later, you know, they've, they've forgotten, they're, they're watching TV, they're not going to tune back in, um, whereas if you can do that in far, far closer, closer to real time, and that's kind of what people expect, right, is you, you don't want to go and open up um, you know, your Netflix or whatever your video player is and see you know, recommendations for stuff that really isn't relevant to you because actually you only cared about that thing at a point in time. You know, you've just watched something, here's something that's going to be far more, more relevant to you. So, and that's just kind of becoming what everyone is expecting, and if you don't get that experience, you're kind of a little bit befuddled as to like, okay, well why why? It, it doesn't really make a huge amount of sense. A lot anymore. of wasted ad dollars. Yeah. You know? yeah. Next, next best action yeah. is, is, to your point, we all expect it. We expect yes. it to be personalized and relevant. Like we were talking yesterday, you know, if you, if you go online and you buy a tent, you don't want to, or you, your analogy was dishwasher. Yeah. You don't want to be served more ads after that transaction is complete for more dishwashers. You want what, exactly. what would go yeah. with that. Or if I want to buy a tent, if I bought a 10, I don't want to be having more ads for 10s, I want things that would go with it. We just have that expectation that wherever we're doing a transaction, that next best action is going to be relevant. Absolutely, and we've, we've, we've just seen an explosion of um, customers and, and partners that are actually using Snowflake to drive these types of marketing and advertising outcomes, and a lot of them are built on these types of real-time and near real-time use cases, so you really need to incorporate that, and, and I think um, Snowflake Streaming is unlocking that for a lot of our partners, and it's allowing them to really drive those, those outcomes. Because you've got so. the user experience, which you're describing, yep. is it's annoying, but the other end of it is you're just wasting money as, yes, as the advertiser. Yes, you're just exactly. you're throwing it away to a to a, a, an individual that has no longer has intent to buy. Yes. Yeah, uh, absolutely bought. zero intent. It absolutely is absolutely zero intent. Um, yeah, I've been told that Amazon does it because like 
a lot of people will then go and return those things and actually it works quite well. So they'll buy a vacuum cleaner and then maybe it won't work out, so they'll still recommend vacuum cleaners, but it feels oh. like a diminishing returns <laughs> yep. sort of thing, which is like, it, it doesn't make sense, like particularly a dishwasher, like, so, do I really yeah. need another? But I mean, maybe they know best. It's, it's yeah, like, maybe they're selling crappy products and they know it's going to break. <laughs> I, I think it goes back to our <laughs> earlier you, point. But, but you, you experience that actually with these days. You just like, mm, do I want to buy that on Amazon? Do I trust that from Amazon or is that? Yeah, like, but I think it gets back, back to our, our earlier point about <laughs> yeah. transparency and having the, the data in Snowflake yeah. and having it explainable, which is like, yeah. if you are going and serving, you know, you bought a dishwasher and you're, you're serving inventory of, you know, dishwasher to that user again, you know, what is the data? What is the behavior that you're capturing on those users? And how do you go and explain that sort of thing? And in a lot of these black box systems, you don't, you don't get that explainability. You're trusting yeah. the algorithm. Um, so a lot of this stuff on data cloud is you're building it yourself. It's within your environment. Um, you can explain it to your stakeholders, but you can also explain it to your, your customers as well. Or you could actually do the, uh, the analytics to design that campaign such that you could ship the initial vacuum cleaner and then have the, ready, the ads for the, the next one that you're going to have to ship after the return ready. So, so, so what does AI do for all this? Because we, we, now we're entering this new era. Yep. What, what's, what's, we're, we're in the before, we're kind of in the middle. What's the after going to look like? I think what this is, is doing is it's really building that data foundation that allows you to unlock those, those AI capabilities, right? So we've said, we've talked a lot about how we're getting that real-time data uh, landing directly in Snowflake. We're getting that to be valid. We have transparency. You've got all of that data unified. So now you actually have the critical data asset that's needed to run those use cases. Um, and you can unlock that in a variety of ways, right? Like you could leverage capabilities that you are building in-house. You may have a data team that's doing that. You can leverage some of the amazing solutions that are driving that um, and building directly on, on Snowflake. So this is building the data foundation that is unified, it's secured, it's e easy to collaborate, and it's easy to, to make that extensible across all of those use cases. So um, that's what's I think also really powerful about this, this partnership. Mike, the name, Snowplow, Snowflake, coincidence? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. A you guys are about ten years old, right? Yeah, about about ten years old. Yeah. Uh, ten or eleven years old, I think. Yeah, and, and I, you guys are probably similar because there was a couple of years in, yeah. in yeah. stealth mode. I so I think, if I remember correctly, Snow Plow is a six months or a year older. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but I think there's there's similar origins of the name, and you know, there are both related to the, the cloud and, and partnership like that. was meant to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it kind of writes itself. There's a little bit of confusion, but there's also a lot of complementary stuff there of going, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like the it's a, it's a solution. Yeah, um, and you still so. every once in a while have to tell a, a Snowflake employee that Snowplow is in fact not a feature, but yes. another organization. Yeah. When I first <laughs> saw it, yet. I thought not it was. Because I'm like, oh, they're just, they're so good with the naming. So Mike, <laughs> you talked about what you guys are doing in terms of helping customers with campaign performance, conversion, next best action. What does the future hold for Snowplow, especially in terms of your Snowflake partnership? Um, look, I think taking more advantage of a lot of these new services um, is, you know, the more and more it grows, you know, we, we started very focused on the data warehouse because that's what it was early on. And we had a lot of early customers going, hey, look, we're looking to migrate off these legacy platforms to, to something new, let's try this. And that's kind of where our partnership started. And I think now it's looking at these new new services. That it, so now for a lot of customers, we're getting asked about LLMs and, you know, what can you do with GPUs in, in Snowflake and how do we do ML and AI? So a lot of it's these more advanced use cases a lot of its infrastructure as well. So now, you know, with, with containers, how do we go and move these workloads that we, we have potentially in other areas closer to the data? And that's both from a security perspective, but also a cost perspective as yeah. well, right? You're not shipping all this compute and, and data around between completely different regions. You're really being able to centralize a lot of that. So I think a lot of it for us is figuring out what are those services as sort of complementary and how can we kind of enhance the Snowplow experience from a, a user perspective perspective and a customer perspective, make it cheaper, make it easier to run, make it more holistic. Um, so take advantage of those services and, and migrate some of those things into sort of the, what is increasingly become this, this larger platform. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Guys, thank you so much for joining Dave and me on the program talking about Snowplow on Snowflake, what you're able to <laughs> enable customers to do. I had to really think about that to make sure I got it right. We appreciate your time and we wish you continued success. Thank you. Thank you All so much right. for having us. Our pleasure. For our guests and for Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. Up next, do you want to be a query boss for your company? Well, we're going to be talking to the CEO and co-founder of Sundac, who's going to tell your data engineers how to achieve just that. Miss any of our content? Thecube.net is where you go. SiliconAngle.com for analysis and editorial. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. <laughs>